Hunter X Hunter episode 126. Well, I think it will be a tomb. So thankful, so grateful. I'll give you a little heart. The ultimate attack. Also a little mini version of what we saw with Knuckle Moral and Yuppie, where, I mean, I don't know. What are we doing? What are we really doing here? Why are we, I don't know. The king, he can get there, you know? He just needs to get through his teen phase. Oh God, that's really what it is, isn't it? It's an angsty teenager with all the nuanced complexity that a teenager has in his view of the world. And then also supreme power to enact it and make it possible. I know what the problem is. It's society. <laughs> society must be destroyed. And then everyone will be happy. Zero X and X Rose. Why is there this structure here? And why was it made for Titans? Some great defense and zero offensive power. And go smush. Unclear how much energy he's even really exerting here. The king. He's moving a lot. Time will be compressed. Is it love? Is everyone's love just being awakened? Wow. He's figuring it out. He's practiced a lot. Yes, at one point. Amazing that the king can feel Netero's whole history. He did. It was a lot more than 10 years. Right, yeah, I was thinking the exact same thing. <laughs> a true gift. My praise. Netero, not so grateful for that one. He's gonna figure it out. I mean, why not if you take no damage? Exactly. He's gonna get it eventually. There's no threat, there's no leverage. Oh, that's so cool, that's a nice throwback. It's very interesting. Speaking of pulling pins. It's a cool image. They use CGI for this. Old soldier. It's <laughs> the love of the game at this point. What's your yeah? What's your plan, Nero? It's not working. You're just basically waiting to lose at this point, unless you have something else. I feel like he actually will honor that condition, though. He will honor the condition of not killing you, even though he doesn't need to. Just out of sheer respect. It was just a small moment, but I really like what the king said about everyone has a personal rhythm, and it's the predilection for certain patterns that shape one's identity. In the last episode, I was saying something about how it's such a thin line to walk, where great things become weaknesses. Weaknesses can become strengths. Trying to walk a path of real greatness and truth and honesty, being in sync with the world, requires a certain amount of fluidity. There is no one answer that is enduring and winning and optimal for, for all situations throughout all of time. I've wondered sometimes if being this kind of person that is just on the slipstream of what is can always put aside oneself for, for lack of a better word, let's call it an optimal choice at any given moment in any given direction. Is it even a person anymore? There's no form to that. So I'm not sure if that's even an ideal. It's the things we set in stone are weird predilections and distinct things that make us distinguishable. And that is maybe partly our contribution as people. It's this unique combination of things that we are that allows us to approach life in this way that is informational feed into the collective pool of humanity so that it, it can figure things out. In fact, I think the way we think about each other is precisely through either our distinct traits that are different from the norm or mean or a combination of those things. So thinking about a particular friend, I don't think about him as the one who breathes air and the one who enjoys food. It's like my friend who always somehow manages to find the right solution to things and find a way to get what he wants. My friend who's always there for me no matter what and always has a positive loving disposition. My wild friend who's always <laughs> unpredictable and is always off doing something crazy. It's like how at people's funerals people like 
like to tell the amusing offbeat anecdotes about a person that made them unique, made them special, gave them a solid identity in the world, which also is an argument for the thing you always hear about how it's important to be yourself, even in your ridiculousness and your folly. Those things that make you different are in some way your unique contribution. You just try to use them positively. I'm not exactly sure what the takeaway is. I mean, Kamugi seems to be the one who had no form, was the sort of optimal slipstream, always right choice, never bound in by habit and practice that made her impossible to defeat. But Kamuki herself is a very distinct and tangible character. So maybe it's something like a combination of both, you know, having your form, but not being too stuck, not letting that be a controlling factor over everything, being able to grow and expand. So you always have a form at any given point, but it's a form that can be molded. It's not fixed forever. Because having no form is probably a weakness. You can make an equivalent for one's outlook and decisions and ideology. Like if you just believe everything is right and you never take any stance on anything, there's nothing really to discuss. There's nothing really you can contribute, even if over committing to any particular idea is a mistake. Same thing with your personality. You know, people who are very open struggle with this. You can't find who you are. You can't build anything because as soon as you do, you start questioning it. Is this right? Is this who I want to be? Given that there are so many other forms I could take, it feels almost like a contradiction, though it doesn't have to be. Where, you know, the, the Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao. You cannot grasp or forge the truth into any one specific item. It's always a moving target. And yet you must have some shape. You must have something, some substance with, with which to interact with the world, with which to explore the ideas of truth in the first place. <laughs> That's sort of what I'm thinking. Okay, I'm glad there's something else here. Zero hands, that's the most powerful, and zero X and X rows. Literally swatting insects. This is the real speed. <laughs> Real time. The slightest sense of dull pain. Oh no. How terrible. That doesn't look good. I think he needs that one. He needed that leg. Hmm, that's not great. That is slightly unsettling. But this isn't defeat for Netero though. Well, he got tagged. Is it the same leg that Gon touched? I think this is it. I just slap it with the hand of God. <laughs> Lucky punch. <laughs> yeah, respect up. That our stock is rising. Alternatively, this could play into the king's weakness that we've seen with Gunji. He may have learned nothing. Against Kamugi, he was constantly over-evaluating his chances of winning, not realizing that the trajectory he was seeing and anticipating was one of just so many, and it relied on a static image of one's character when Kamugi was not at all static in the game. Netero may not be as static as the king thinks in his combat, speaking of fluidity of choice and identity, which, you know, somewhat mirrors the king. He is definitely learning and growing, but being an adolescent, he is sort of locked in and not really seeing that, that sort of unknown unknown of what you're missing. You know, sometimes conviction is a result of a lack of understanding of the alternatives and all the things you're not considering. Yeah, we'll see where this falls. Speaking of uh, Gunji though, this could be a gambit. Oh wow. Well, I mean, it is a long time. In Gunji and Chas and Chogi, you sometimes sacrifice pieces to win. There are a lot of traps in these games. <laughs> and flowers. It's a little bit of an edge. You found the pin. The one needle among infinite. Oh! He called it. It's mildly unsettling. It's not defeat. It's very gold-like. 
I always knew this man was crazy. Yeah, come to think of it, not only is this a throwback to his condition in the final stages of the Hunter exam, it's also a throwback to that dodgeball game or whatever, the tag game. He's now gotten tagged twice. I feel like there's something extra that I'm not seeing. Like, Gon and the King are, are being set up as being on the same spectrum. They're similar characters, no? Maybe I'm imagining it. Or it could just be a coincidence. Gon is the protagonist. The King is the central antagonist. So there's that. But there's more as well. And they both have that stubbornness. They have the kind of blinders on. This is the way I'm, I'm going to do things. My will is supreme. How much I love and respect you is related to how well you fit into what I'm willing to accept and what I already value, what you do for me. If that is true, I think what will be most interesting is figuring out what makes them different. What is the difference between them and what prevails? The king, I mean, seems to be growing more than Gon. I can pray him with no arms. The hand was a distraction. The hands. Wild. I beat you. I smush you with love? What is this? And flash to Kilua. Murderous intent. Oh, right. Yeah, he, he met that aura, made him flee. I'm confused. It's love, but also it's murderous. The murderous power of love. And you give him the middle finger while he's at it too, just for good measure. <laughs> it's kind of obscene. I love it. God just barfing its love onto you. <laughs> Purifying, blinding barf. At last we have dealt 2 HP. The king sensed a dull ache in his body. That's probably it. I think that's it. He lost some mass. But I don't just mean from his missing limbs. Lost a lot of mass. And that love, that holding that god in his heart was keeping his body together. To admit defeat now. That's unfortunate for you. Oh, he cut him a, a bit. I am a little bit more scratched than before. You have made me disheveled. Uh, can we go into the negatives? I think that's it, right? Yeah, it's funny to me, it's not just it's not just humans, it's like all living things. I am the collective force of nature. The entire ocean was eaten, basically. Okay, this is a very clear statement, I think. Very directly, this whole natural force, this compulsion of things to consume and breed. The king is that manifest, and yeah, you're not going to beat that. Along the same playing field of competition. What I think is cool about that, and I think where this is going and what the king will discover, is that actually that animal thing is not mutually exclusive with the, the higher functioning, cognitive, sacrificial, benevolent force that humans are capable of. In fact, I think it's an offshoot of it. It's a, it's a result of it. It's an answer to it. As much as we think the two are separate, I think I've reached the conclusion largely from this arc that it's a mistake to think of them as, as different things. Speaking of structure, it's a ceiling and a floor that makes existence possible and repeatable. The floor is that just raw animal passion to breed, eat, survive, continue. The ceiling is that protective force where if it's only that, if my immediate pleasures and gratifications and needs are the only thing that matters, then nothing can survive and there is no hope for any propagation or perpetuation. The system just destroys itself. It's not that one is better than the other or one has to win over the other. It's about the harmony of the two. <laughs> A special zone. We've made it, everyone. We did it. Thank you, benevolent king. I'm not defeated yet? Is <laughs> there someone else in the room with us right now? Okay, I gave it to him. He's got another whole side of his attacks. So it didn't feel like surrender, even though he gave him his name. I don't think this is love anymore.
人間の底すらない進化をそれは That's the first time he feels fear. It's pretty terrifying. And there doesn't feel beaten. And then there are knows that humanity's limits are meant to be broken. He's the living embodiment of that. What is this whole other side of Netero that we don't know? This image, though, is crazy. What kind of crazy condition is this? Beating heart condition. Whoops, you lost the Gunji again. We did not have this backstory though. And then I was just kind of playing a game, just having fun before all this. Oh, he installed something. He did this deliberately before the fight. And he designed it with some real flair and Netero's styled elegance. Wow. I had a very strong feeling that Netero was going to lose, but I didn't realize it would be that amazing. There was so much build-up and so much hype for this, but it paid off. It's interesting that it talks about don't underestimate humanity and its ingenuity come right before <laughs> he unleashes a nuclear bomb that's popular with small dictatorships. It's not always going to be a good thing. Netero hitting him with a very real-world version of human ingenuity for power, somewhat ambiguously, or maybe even not ambiguously, because it was framed by this massive red skull. But also in the shape of a heart, it's very odd. It's a, a very unique form of gratitude. <laughs> the more I think about it, the more I love it. It's very fitting with Netero. What we've seen of him so far. I mean, thinking about the Hunter exam and who passes, it wasn't necessarily that people with good hearts passed. It was people with something to offer, with potential, with power that were selected for. People who added something, people who contributed something. It's a very sort of zoomed out take on what contribution is, what gifts are. I mean, there is a way to look at it where even the things that are destructive are positive and good if they create feedback into the world that is needed. You can think about it as if something is possible, it's probably going to happen. And so it's good that it happens because then we just have iterated the chain to its logical conclusion and we can move on from there. We've got that thing taken care of. What's going to happen happens. We've created something new. So therefore we've built, we've grown in the grand scheme of things. It's a little bit unsatisfying of an argument to make. It's a little bit unsympathetic and downplays things. Like for example, the atomic bomb, you can say, well, it's good that the the atomic bomb was made because it was going to be made because it existed as possibility for humanity it was going to happen sooner or later it's good that it happened when it did we got the atomic bomb we realized this danger we have to acclimate to it but of course it's the atomic bomb unspeakable atrocities have been committed with the atomic bomb so which is it but it is human ingenuity it is human power it is definitely transcending natural physical limits it's definitely synthesis of something actually there is an example for me that's a little bit less gray which is the internet because these days i hear a lot of people talk about how the internet has been catastrophic for human health and happiness specifically certain forms of the internet which is unfortunate it, but I'm reluctant to paint it as a negative thing because the internet is such a tremendous addition to potential to single out the negative effects in a very, very small snapshot of time, I think doesn't give it full nuance and clarity to the total picture, where at least I want to think that the pains of it are probably just the introductory faces, where it's something that kind of has to be gone through, but for which there is a solution. And we will emerge, hopefully, probably, I believe, having sort of dealt with the shock of this new thing suddenly in our lives, and we'll have found a healthy homeostasis, but now with the additional capabilities and gifts of the internet. It's also really fitting for the king to have gone through it in this way, always thinking he had Kamugi checkmated, being very self-assured and having all the answers and being able to figure everything out on his own to trace that causal link from planned implementation, much like his dictatorship stranglehold plans, only to find that there's a lot beyond what he can see. His conviction is a blindness and an arrogance. I was sort of musing that maybe Netero's gambit was to show the king that he couldn't necessarily plan everything. You couldn't even do this right. You couldn't even force me to admit defeat without killing me. I don't think it was that directly, but just through consequence, there is something there about that. It doesn't feel like the king defeated Netero in a very significant sense. He also couldn't foresee the full picture of the battle strategy. He did get caught off guard, despite him thinking like he could see the million needles and threading a path, etc. Netero did shock him. Netero giving him his name almost felt like a courtesy. It didn't feel like the king had really mastered that and gotten it out of Netero through the force of his own planning and will. There were a lot of surprises for him in that fight. The blast probably will serve to weaken him enough for other characters to come in and actually have a standing chance. That probably is Netero's battle contribution, but it's clearly not the end of the king. There's still too much that needs to happen with him. But more significantly than the battle, I wonder if this isn't testing his belief in himself a little bit. This sort of top down. I am the, the grand ruler of everything. I am the chosen one. Everything I say is right. All of you are lesser creatures. The king has shown his ability to grow and think. His danger is that there's just not enough light coming in from the shadows 
behind his conception. There are too many unknown unknowns, but maybe this is something that will cast a light on the fact that he really isn't as capable as he thinks. There's so much more to it than he's conceptualized up to this point. What he thinks is important for the species and for life and nature isn't the ultimate in what is actually important for life and nature. There's an invisible thread that he can sense, much to his frustration, like he sensed with Kamugi in Gunji, but can't yet grasp. This is yet another failure along the same lines. So who has it? Where is it? Maybe that's the thought that emerges for the king after this experience. Maybe that's Netero's ultimate contribution. Netero is such a fascinating character, you know, not necessarily good or bad, or had elements of both. Not someone I always trusted to have purest intentions. I can defend his philosophy. It's intact. I just think it's a little bit too zoomed out, but ultimately he sacrificed his life in service to humanity, even if there were selfish motivations mixed in there. He went out like an absolute badass, ultimate champion, was never actually beaten, which is weird to say considering that he could not damage the king and also died. But as a viewer, it feels to me like a victory somehow, and also speaks to that Gunji-like thing of what is the actual game being played? Who's actually setting the pace and the rhythm? What game are you really playing? Which also is a very Hunter x Hunter thing from the beginning. I don't know if Netero really was playing the highest game, but he definitely was playing his game to the end. And I think his legacy will be felt. After seeing this, I'm even more curious why he would ever answer to any sort of political body or Hunter committee. He could do all this. With that in mind, he actually showed tremendous restraint in the world. It's also interesting to think that Netero's plan from the beginning probably involved dying. Seems like he just accepted that. Yet he wanted to make sure he had his fun first. <laughs> he made that condition of don't kill me, even though he planned on being killed. I guess he just wanted to do it himself. It wasn't totally about the victory or defeat. There was something more at stake, which I think we saw the culmination of. If it was just about defeating the king, Netero walks in there and just sticks two fingers in his chest and it's over. There was a gift there somewhere. There was a gift of his personality and his traits and his experience, all the things he's learned that he gave to the king. That was the real move, the real game. Thank you.